In this video, we are exploring the intricacies of various imagery of the Columbian Exposition or Chicago World's Fair of 1893. These visuals are depicting inconsistencies within an event that was truly monumental in American history. So why is it downplayed, tampered with, and in some cases, forgotten? This is only a small piece of a much larger historical narrative that many before me have researched and explored. It is a representation of my personal findings to reinforce the idea that historical data points have absolutely been manipulated. This is not a complete history of the event itself. Instead, we will be pulling at various historical threads and explore many examples of how and potentially why this imagery has been tampered with. So, if you are interested in learning about the story of the Chicago World's Fair and the manipulation contained within its historical pages, you can learn about it with me. Now before delving into the event itself, we will need to build a foundation for pattern recognition. So let's begin with a quick introduction into layer masks or masking. I'm sure many are familiar with the term and program Photoshop. This is a program used primarily for editing images. It is part of the Adobe suite of various programs that many graphic artists use for many multimedia projects. I'm quite familiar with this suite as my education, background, and occupations for over a decade was working with these programs as a graphic artist or designer. I'm by no means an expert, however this is the lens in which these images in this presentation will be dissected. So let's briefly look at how Adobe themselves describe what layer masking is. Layer masking is a non-destructive way to hide parts of an image or layer without erasing them. They're great for making image composites, modifying background colors, removing or cutting out objects, and targeting your edits so they affect only certain areas rather than the entire layer. Now an important term to also define will be image composites or composite image. A composite image is essentially the use or the combination of two or more different images to create a new one. For example, I may take a picture of a sunset on a beach then remove the skyline of the sunset and replace it with an image of the night sky. This new scene is now two images merged into one and is now a composite image. So a question that arises is, can this be used as accurate representation of truth? I could persuade someone that I took this photo at night on the beach. However, is that the truth? Could this be used as a historical photo for this beach and records for the future? Keep that thought in the back of your mind as we look through these examples. So we can venture back into the history while using examples from the documents surrounding the fair to explore masking and composite images. So our story begins by referring to the official source for this magnificent fair. And you don't have to take my word for it. And I quote, Campbell's illustrated history of the world's Columbian Exposition is the most reliable and complete work on the world's greatest exposition. From its inception to its close is without question. We would not be wise to make such a statement unless we were justified in doing so. The fact that it received the highest and only award together with the most enthusiastic endorsement of officials, fully warrants our statement. So do you dare question this document that received the highest and the only award? You scoundrels. Further on we get to an interesting statement which reads as follows. The illustrations are from photographs reproduced on copper plate. Now in my opinion, we have here the direct and indirect evidence of three mediums being used to represent the following images. Copper plate engravings, photographs, and indirectly, 
illustrations. We even have another quick reference to the fact that there are photographic illustrations within these pages. Now to reiterate before proceeding, we will quote a few more sentences here in this introduction. This information was furnished by the officials, thus making the history authentic and correct. Every facility was afforded and every avenue of information was open to us that would enable us to make a work that would be worthy the title of the prize history of the exposition. Thus, it will be seen that the following pages are not filled with stories of tradition or information gathered from dusty manuscripts, taken from dingy pigeonholes, or from the chambers of musty vaults. Now, this last sentence almost has the essence of what is now labeled misinformation. You know, if you decide to critically think and research, you're labeled a conspiracy theorist. Yet back in this time, if you decided to question anything, they may look at you and say, This good sir of tomfoolery and hijinks would gather such information from dusty manuscripts and dingy pigeonholes. He is clearly a musty vault dweller and should be considered mentally unfit. But I jest. That's enough shenanigans for now. Let's look at some examples. We begin with one of our first images in this book, and that is of Thomas W. Palmer, who was labeled as the president of the world's Columbian Commission. And this image shows the basic concept of masking, the process of cutting out a specific element to place in another image or in this case, to remove completely and place on a white background. Something to please take note of is the blending around the bottom of the image, creating what appears to be a, a feathering or blurring, which is basically the foggy effect around the clothing. This is an effect that we will see throughout some of the following images. So, how did they do this? Well, we are going to refer to a book from 1908 called complete self-instructing library of practical photography and was published by the American School of Art and Photography in Scranton, Pennsylvania. It details a term called etching, which would be similar to masking, and it reads as follows. Etching is exactly the reverse of retouching, for by means of the etching knife, which is a very sharp steel blade, the film is shaved or scraped in proportion to the amount required to be removed. Thus highlights are reduced, shadows accentuated, objectionable portions removed, and detail produced where the opacity of the negative was so strong as to destroy it. Now furthermore on this page we discuss retouching to both model the portrait or perfect the landscape. And I do want to explore section 10 to further understand this concept. And it reads as follows. Many times the operator fails to correctly light the subject. And the false lights, which will then exist, must be removed and correct the lights built up. The negative may be under or overexposed, under or overdeveloped. There are times also when it is necessary to alter the expression to remove a scowl or to close an open mouth with teeth showing. The drapery may have to be changed and imperfections removed, which the operator has failed to overcome. It is for these and many more reasons that retouching is necessary. The photographer, in making the negative, should aim to reproduce in the portrait the very best qualities of the individual, subduing the more undesirable features. If he has failed in this, his retoucher must do what he can to correct the oversight or deficiency. So, an incredibly interesting section and insight into photo manipulation of the past. However, I do want to draw your attention to the last sentence stating that if the photographer has failed to properly photograph the intended subject, his retoucher must do what they can to correct the oversight or deficiency. 
Now this really opened my eyes to the idea that this was not necessarily a rare process or an exception even, but it is the norm in this area of business. Simply, if, if you were in the photography business, a retoucher was part of your staff. Much like a multimedia studio would have various positions like a copyright, a graphic designer, a web specialist, a photographer, etc., uh, having a retoucher would be an essential part of your photography business. So no, they didn't have Photoshop in the late 19th century. The retoucher was the Photoshop. It was a tactile position of literally slicing and mixing elements to edit images and photographs. So keep this idea in mind as we look at some more examples later on that are present in this book to showcase the ability of the time. And to note, I collected this specific book about practical photography after learning about it from watching Mind Unveiled's video called Old World Photoshop which I will link below and highly recommend for anyone interested in this topic. This portrait was chosen as our initial photo not only because it is quite literally one of the first examples of masking, but because our next image will show this in concept while leading to our next definition, composite image. Now this image is showing the Chicago Citizens Delegation to Washington to secure the World's Fair. Now we're going to focus on the left side and immediately see the workings that will be present through the rest of this showcase. Now this is an example of masking or photo editing. This man is clearly in a different format and the shades of black are substantially different from almost every other figure in this photograph. He has an indication of a white stroke around his jacket pointing to being cut out and placed into this image. The edges are jagged and the placement a bit is a bit odd in my opinion. And every member in this image is numbered, yet this man starts a new labeling system of letters. And he is A. Why is that? Would it not be less obvious to just add more numbers so our next example is well how odd a man labeled b again clearly masked in the edges are jagged showing both white strokes around the clothing while black strokes surround the head there is some possible blending artifacts by his shoulder and number 45's ear right here Plus the proportions appear off again. He's much bigger than his surrounding colleagues. He simply looks out of place. Next is C. The lighting or highlights are inconsistent. Again, the jagged and poorly blended edges around the figure. The proportions are not quite equal to the surrounding people and he looks about the same size as the previous Mr. B. Now, on the very right, we have D. And it really seems like they just slipped this guy into the right here. He just made it into the picture. You can notice the edging of the jackets between D and Mr. 49 below. Especially around the ear here where it looks like 49 is representing a thick and substantially voluptuous mullet. Now the edging on the left of the face shows an indication that this man has been, has been placed in. So overall, there were four men included in this image that were not there initially. And this is now not a photograph, but is a composite image. This is no longer historical documentation. It is edited history. So taking another example within this book, uh, we look at an exhibit in the agricultural building, which is labeled a photograph. Now in the previous example, we looked at masking people where this image shows the masking of elements or objects within the photograph. Now, initially we see the flags, they look to have illustrated elements, like the strokes around the edges. They could be entirely illustrated. This entire scene itself has been masked and separated from its surroundings and simply placed on a white background, or rather the background has been removed. 
So was this merely to focus on the exhibit itself? You can see the masking attempts in between the panels even on the right side of the wall. Dips into some while others, especially below the sign that is under the flags, the wall is still present within the negative space. Notice how intricate the masking effect is with the triangular elements on the left side. It's not perfect, however it is quite impressive for this time period, and hopefully shows the potential of this ability, or technology if you will. So our next example is that of a masked building, showing again the basic concept of masking an element into an image or completely removing it. In this case, the background has been completely removed and replaced with a white background. There are some lines around the edges of the building that seem slightly crooked. Uh, some areas on the chimney appear to have leftover artifacts or elements, specifically this middle one on the left. There may be some artifacts on the lower section here. So, here we go. There may be something off about the areas above or around the chimneys. Sometimes when you cut out or mask elements, you may get a stroke around the element. It's hard to be that precise. The equivalent of cutting out uh, a colored picture on a white background and leaving some white pieces around the edge. These artifacts are just the reverse, leaving darker lines on the page. Maybe this is pushing it. Think of that what you will. But that is the kind of detail that we're looking for. Overall, it's quite well done, and at a glance, will pass. So these images are meant to represent the capabilities of masking in general. We have seen the masking of people, then objects in an exhibit, and now an entire building. The final image for this section will be one of the horticultural hall being done in silver filigree work. Now I had no idea what that was and it led to a solid night of watching several videos of various artists crafting jewelry. And it is essentially the art of crafting intricate metalwork using or usually jewelry by twisting threads of metal into elaborate patterns. It is beyond impressive and can only imagine the amount of time and effort that went into creating this specific work. Now, the main objective with this photo, however, is to present the final piece of our masking foundation. To show that it could be entirely possible to create a scaled model, photograph it, mask in various elements like vegetation, water, and even people to give it life, exchange the skyline to give it context, and now you have a completely modified representation of this building to fit a specific narrative. That will conclude the masking slash etching demonstration. And from here we will look briefly at some examples that are shown within this photography book to showcase the ability of a retoucher. So we need to move on to breaking down our thumbnail so this will be quick. So initially we have the removal of freckles, blemishes, and making the skin cleaner, more vibrant, and correcting tints and shades. This simply labeled as stages of elementary retouching. Next, we have the removal of this woman's shoulder and some minor retouching work, labeled as practical application of the etching knife. Here we have another example of slicing the waistline of subjects, labeled as reducing the size of stout subjects. This example shows the ability to correct features on the face, this one labeled straightening crossed eyes. My favorite by far is this example that shows how our retoucher can fix up your thick neck. Now I think thick may be an understatement here, however the end result is incredibly impressive. Now, all of these examples really surprised me, However, this last one really showcases the ability, I feel. And this is literally adding drapery or adding clothing to a subject. Now notice the necklace has been adjusted and re-illustrated. The entirety of the top portion of the clothing has been illustrated. I mean, we need... 
we really need to understand that this ability was far beyond what is acknowledged today. This is impeccable work for the time period. It literally broke my, my paradigm of what is possible. Now these examples are meant to show the extent of photo editing and manipulation. So let's get back to our story and dive back into some historical documents of the fair. Now that we have a basic foundation, we will explore the thumbnail image in more detail. Now this will sharpen our ability to catch illustrative elements. And once you begin to see this type of work, you will be able to spot this for yourself. And that is the intention to provide my perspective and information and then allow you to discern for yourself. Do not take this at face value. Please investigate for yourself. I only hope to present a persuasive enough argument that will intrigue further research for peers and viewers. And if you do discover anything related to this type of work, please let me know what you find. I would absolutely love to hear about it, whether you agree or disagree. Uh, that's the only way we will grow and move forward through this type of research. Now, this is a view of the administration building on the fairgrounds. And before proceeding further, I would like to present some details about the photos in the thumbnail. And I know, I know I'm drawing this out. Please bear with me. I'm trying to provide receipts. All books and videos shown in this presentation will be linked below. Check them out for yourself. So, take some of the terms and wording into consideration of these books. For the right image, it is a book published in 1893 and is called Glimpses of the World's Fair, a selection of gems of the White City seen through a camera. Again, to reiterate, seen through a camera. Now we look at our left image, again from 1893, called the Columbian Exposition Album, or the Morning Advertiser's Souvenir, the World's Fair. And then looking closer at the seal here, we see the typography. It reads, independent and truthful. So take note of these details, guys. And our middle photo here, again, 1893. This one is a bit of a mouthful. It is called the World's Fair Album, containing photographic views of buildings, statuary grounds, interiors, midway place and scenes, and other objects of interest at the World's Columbian Exposition, Chicago, 1893. So again, taking note of the term photographic views. So a quick look at the preface too of this last book we just mentioned, as there are details that I feel are relevant. It is this constant mixing of mediums we are initially told that these are photographic views in all three books, actually. Yet here, we read statements such as, To accomplish this twofold design, the illustrations were so selected. Each building is also separately treated in a manner that renders obvious the character and scope of its design, which, in my opinion, is a complete nod to masking. Many thousands of views were taken from which to select the fittest. Now, wording can be an important clue here. So you don't take an engraving or take an illustration, but you do take a photo. The photography, engraving, and printing are each to the work of a master of his art. Now here again we have three mediums being mentioned. While throughout the pages of these books, the medium is rarely if ever mentioned. Also, the statement master of his art, I mean master is doing some serious heavy lifting. Uh, well, you will see the master's handiwork soon enough. Alright, I've delayed too much, Let's let's dive into this thing. 
So here we have our thumbnail. Here we have these three images. And we have three different illustrative lamp elements. Now, they're similar in dimension, yet they have different art styles. The first one on the left, and yes, this is an element. This is an illustration. It has no crowning detail that the other two do. Now, the top half of it, it, it looks crooked and not even in a perspective way, just straight up drawn awkwardly. Uh, the other two seem a bit more even in this regard. Now we have this ornamentation on the middle picture here that we don't have on the left or the right. And we have these lighting patterns on the lamps themselves. The left looks like an attempt at actual you know, dimensionality, where the middle is more of a stroke around the outside. And the right almost seems... Uh, maybe a mix of the two, both line, highlights, and shading. Uh, also, we see the module here holding the light itself. It looks solid on the left and middle images, while it either appears transparent on the right or just has two single elements holding the light. Now, that was just the light pole itself. I mean, we can go over some of the remaining details here in this image, or these images rather. We have different brush or ink markings on the underside of the bridges. The water in the third image actually looks quite real and would argue that this is a photographic element rather than an illustration compared to the first image where the water is, uh, it is clearly illustrated. Now the third image looks the most convincing for a photograph, yet we still have small indications of illustration, such as the front of the boat, the line work of the bricks on the bridge, we have highlights on the main lamp element in the thumbnail as we discussed, we have strokes of white on the water, we have the people on the far left that look illustrated, here in the middle picture, it includes many of the same features of illustration and is quite clear in many cases, such as the, the light, again, element in the thumbnail, the plants on the far left, we have highlights on the railings and on the lamps, we have highlights in the water under the bridge, we have highlights on the bears. And now looking at our first image, the left image, again, contains many indications of the previous. I mean, look at the strokes on the water. The highlights on the lamps, again, the white strokes on the flagpoles on the far left, and the oars of the boat statue. Uh, it is quite apparent that these are clearly illustrated, either partly or possibly completely. So these are the types of details that we're trying to look at. Some instances are obvious, and some are well hidden. Once you see these details, as previously mentioned, and, and consider this as a possibility. Then it's added to your lexicon of pattern recognition and can become easier to spot. And here, listen, I'm still learning myself and basically just presenting my findings. Just be discerning with this information. Confirm the info for yourself, regardless of my bias or yours. So, let's continue with our story. Next, we explore some evidence of assets being used within a series of images. Now, an asset could be described as an image itself, a written content, a document, audio, logos, etc. In this case, we are looking at more tangible assets that a retoucher would create while etching a photo or a negative. It would be similar to making a collage cutting out or etching out rather various elements to then place in different images creating some of the scenes we have already viewed and would be described as composite images now here we have a selection of three images that all depict the view of the administration building from afar there is one striking difference in these photos so see if you can spot it while i explain the sources the first image on the left is from Campbell's illustrated history of the world's Columbian Exposition. 
The middle image is from the book Glimpses of the World's Fair, a selection of gems of the White City seen through a camera. The final image on the right is from a book called Official Views of the World's Columbian Exposition. Now, the left image and the right image are closest in position in terms of where this is photographed. The middle image is a bit further back, but still looking in the direction as the other two. In the left image, we have a tree in the path. Two, actually, directly in the path. Now, these trees are clearly not present in the other two images, except for the one tree on the far left of the image. It appears in all of these photographs, all of these images, and you can tell by its lean to the left. Now, these two trees are either illustrated in with little detail of shadowing, or they were already there, growing up through the ground and were later removed in subsequent photos. If they were illustrated in, why? What would be the purpose of that? Is it to hide or distort something behind the trees? To add beauty? To add interest to the image? Is this possibly an asset that has been trimmed from another image and then placed here? What are your thoughts? We can also see that the tree on the right side of the path, in both the left and right image, is not there in the middle image. Now, this could be explained away as pruning or basic gardening, uh, possibly. However, this would seem like a blatantly foolish mistake to leave trees in the middle of pathways, and then to remove a tree that was clearly out of the way entirely, like the one on the right. So now let's add a fourth photo into the mix, and this image comes from, again, Campbell's Illustrated History of the World's Columbian Exposition, Again, very official, as we have discussed earlier. So let's note a few things. This is indeed the same image as the previous three. We don't have a walkway or bridge, which would indicate a uh, construction photo, I suppose. Straight ahead in the center of this image, we have what appears to be an illustrated building. Very basic, flat color, no dimension, and seems to stick out once it's pointed out. Looking at the window of the building, shown on the right side, we can see the depth, we can see the detail and the ornamentation, and even the depths and the shades of black. This is just simply non-existent in this building in the center. Also, we literally have the same trees portrayed in this picture as the left picture in the initial three. So check out the branches of this tree and reference back and forth. This is the same tree. Strangely, it is in a different position. So let's do some basic perspective work here. The tree in the first image on the left is placed on the path before the bridge and clearly before this large building shown on the right. Now in this new image, the same tree, with leaves on it now, is portrayed in line with that building. Not only is it on the other side of the river, it is literally beside the building on the right. This is, this is blatant. I would postulate that we are dealing with editing on the scale of having assets that could be cut out, drawn in, repositioned, layered, and then create a believable composite image. This is incredibly impressive, uh, maddening, and somewhat terrifying all at the same time. How can we trust this kind of deception as historical documentation? Overall, it is a curious set of images with many blatant inconsistencies. However, our next image shows why we need to be discerning with this information. Now, a quick side on the segment we just viewed. I do want to be fair and objective and present as much data as possible. And if that means getting humbled and proved incorrect, then so be it. Now here's a photo further in this book of Campbell's illustrated history. 
and it clearly shows the building in which I stated was illustrated. This is precisely why this type of work is so difficult, because some instances appear to be edited, when in actuality they may not be, and I'm sure there are instances that are the exact opposite. Now I still feel like this doesn't do any justice to the tree situation that was discussed, and maybe it is a perspective issue, maybe it has been edited. I do want to be fair with myself and you as the viewer, and not dictate your decision, but try to present this fairly. Will there be bias? Absolutely. There is still plenty of evidence that these historical documents have been tampered with. So from here, we are going to look at two more examples, and then wrap this presentation up. These examples are from a book called Art and Handicraft in the Women's Building of the World's Columbian Exposition. By taking a brief look at the preface of this particular book, we have the indication that the images throughout are illustrations. Take note of the company Rand, McNally, and Co, because we will look further into them in future presentations. So let's take a look at the statue of Columbus located at the administration building within the fair. Starting off, this image is classified as an engraving, and even if that were the case, it is clearly evident that many parts of this image have been painted over or completely illustrated. Not to mention the reflections on the windows appear incredibly realistic and would argue this is a photographic element. So let's begin our inspection. As we zoom in here, we can see there are highlight strokes on the statue, there's some on the flag, they're on the sword, they're on Columbus himself, there's strokes on his armor and detailing on the robe, and the fabric of the flag. Even the writing on the statue appears edited. Now looking at the men in this photo, they all seem to have some sort of graphic element added whether it's small white highlights, gray shading, or in the instance of this man on the right, completely illustrated. The, this amount of editing brings forth an obvious question. Did this man exist at all? Did any of these men actually appear in this engraving, in this photo? Are they all illustrated? This is a concerning issue. We have missing or vague elements to confirm this line of questioning with the lack of basic shadowing. Where are they? Where, where are the shadows? Finally, the upper left of this image presents a sloppy paint job indicating what appears to be a pillar, and to the right of that are ornamental details that have been illustrated or painted over. Now, before moving on, I would like to touch back on the fact that this image was classified as an engraving. We will see many images from this particular collection, and they are all classified as engravings. However, remember, the initial preface in this book indicates that these are indeed illustrations. So, these labels of illustrations, engravings, photographs, and even photogravures are mixed and interchangeable, it seems, with almost all visual media associated with this exposition. And to provide evidence for this point, we move on to another example from this same book. And now that you have seen a few of these examples, I would like to draw your attention to the bottom of this image and work your way around the Great Basin here. There are clearly many illustrated elements. Take a look. The people are illustrated, and not just one or two or a few. Everyone is illustrated. The lights have painted highlights, and many may be completely drawn in. Our statue has white strokes of highlights along the robe, and on the base even, along with darker strokes to indicate the corners. Highlights on the administration building in the center, on the other end of the lagoon, and many more, I'm sure. The thing is, I 
believe this was most likely a photograph due to the absolutely flawless texture of the water. Is it possible that it could be illustrated? It is possible, but not probable, at least from my research. It could also be masked in, which we have explored extensively. What I'm trying to explain with these types of images is that they are intentionally mislabeled and intentionally confusing as to what types of medium they are produced in. Clearly, it is not just a single one. It is multiple. The collecting of various digital copies of now thousands of books and browsing some of the world's most curious illustrations, engravings, woodcuts, paintings, and photographs has provided a unique perspective into the histories of our past through visual mediums, uh, in some cases creating worlds of their own from a single picture. A picture is worth a thousand words, as they say. Yet some pictures have left me speechless. Not necessarily in amazement of any semblance of beauty, but bewilderment of how much they have been edited and tampered with. What we have here is an indication of how pervasive this editing has been. At this point, it is not a question of if this was done. It is more a question of how perfected this deception has become during this time. And sometimes I question whether these blatant edits are a false scent to throw people off the trail of thinking that maybe entire catalogs of quote-unquote photographic evidence is in actuality merely drawings, hyper-realistic illustrations or engravings, or maybe even models, as was presented earlier. Now, these images are all classified as either illustrations, engravings, or photographs, Yet there is no specification as to which is which in many of these publications, and some appear to be a combination, leading to seemingly more confusion than any clarity, almost like a game of visual telephone where each iteration becomes more obscured and the end result is significantly altered. So this will be the end of this introductory presentation of photo manipulation of the past, I know that to those who understand these concepts, it may have been drawn out. However, I felt it was necessary to build a solid foundation for future explorations, because from here, we are going deep into these books. Not only of this particular event, but throughout many albums or books that contain images of history in general. The next few videos will be focused on Campbell's illustrated history of the world's Columbian Exposition, both Volume 1 and 2. There is an incredible amount of information within these books, along with so many images to browse and explore. So this will most likely be turned into a series, and truly hope that those watching enjoyed this presentation and look forward to future videos. Now that you have seen some examples and learned some basics of how these images have been manipulated, I suggest you look back in this video to catch some of the earlier images that I used that may have these exact inconsistencies. Post your findings below. I'm sure you'll find a few. To end this video, I wanted to include a quote from a book I just read called Listen to the Land Speak by Mankin. Megan. It seemed to fit particularly well with this presentation, and it reads as follows. For those of us who have been reared on simplistic narratives and linear timelines, the absence of a reasoned sequence of cause and effect can be bewildering. Modern historical accounts make for a neat story and an easy way to digest reality, but they are not complete. They are an arrangement of carefully selected facts and subjective interpretations made to fit tidily into each other. Think of them as a handy and practical facade, but don't be hoodwinked into believing that they represent anything more than that. So have we been hoodwinked? 
that is up to you to decide. I certainly was. From here onward, however, that will not be the case. For myself, and for those of you interested enough to watch and listen to these presentations. Along with many others in this alternative history community, we are dismantling this facade, one image at a time. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time, and hopefully this was enjoyable, entertaining, and informative. If you gained any value from this, give the video a like. Let me know your thoughts below in the comments. And if you are interested in learning more about the manipulation of historical documents, consider subscribing and learning about it with me.